Iowa Hawkeye wrestling fans. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Apparently John is. <laughs> okay, so we do have, we have a couple of Iowa wrestling fans. I have, I have been a fan of Iowa wrestling for many, many, many years. My, I remember my dad taking me uh, to Carver Hawkeye Arena and watching wrestling when I was young. And we would watch guys like Ed and Lou Bannock wrestle. Does anybody remember these guys? Yes. You guys remember them? Okay. All right. I, I, love, I love wrestling. And you guys understand that when I'm talking about wrestling, I'm talking about this kind of wrestling and not like hitting people over the head with chairs wrestling. I'm talking about that kind, right? What, one of the things that I love about wrestling, about college wrestling, is, is the fact that it's a team sport that depends entirely on individual wrestlers doing their job well. And so when I watch wrestling, and I, I, I watch it as often as I can, when I watch wrestling, I always watch to see how each person, each wrestler, is going to approach his match in a way that will help the team win. And you know what I find? This is kind of interesting. What I find is not all wrestlers approach their matches with the same attitude, with the same tenacity, with the same mindset. And so as I watch match after match after match, I start, I start asking this question in my mind. What is it that makes a wrestler a good wrestler? What makes a wrestler a good wrestler? And it's, I'll tell you something, it is not just winning the match. It's not. I mean, I've, I've seen many, many wrestlers who come out and they, all they want to do is just wrestle a purely defensive match and they just hope to win two to one. I, I, I don't know that I would call that good wrestling. You know, good wrestling is when you come out with this, with this balance of aggressiveness and awareness of your opponent every single time. Every time. A good wrestler wrestles to win their match. There's this, there's this guy on the Hawkeyes right now named, named Spencer Lee. Really like him. He's a young guy. He's a sophomore. But I really, really like him because he strikes me as a good wrestler. You watch him. Every time he comes out, he's understanding what he needs to bring to defeat this opponent. He's a good wrestler. A good wrestler wrestles to win. And a good wrestler wrestles for the Hawkeyes. Amen? Yeah, that's right. So I know, I know what makes a wrestler a good wrestler. My question today is, what is it that makes a church leader a good church leader? Is it the ability to get things done? Is it a faithful heart? Is it character? Is it certain personality traits? What makes a church leader a good church leader? Now, I'll tell you, if you ask a whole bunch of different churches, you'll get different answers because churches have different qualifications for leadership. So you won't always get the same answer for this. But today, what I want us to think about just for a little bit is how do Baptists tend to answer that question? What is it that makes a church leader a good church leader. So today is the last day in this series that we're doing on Baptist distinctives. These are, these are beliefs that we hold as Baptists that make us a little bit different from other Christian churches, right? We hold on to Jesus Christ as the source of our salvation. That makes us Christian. We join all other Christian churches in affirming that truth and that reality. But there are other nuances and other interpretations and beliefs that we as Baptists hold that make us a little different from other church denominations, and, and all churches have these. So we've been looking at ours. What is it that makes us Baptist? And so we've covered a number of them so far, right? We, we talked about biblical authority. We talked about the autonomy of the local church the priesthood of all believers. We talked about the two ordinances, which are, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. We talked about individual soul freedom, and we talked about the separation of church and state. And, and again, we, we record all of these, and so if you missed any, you can go online onto the church website or Facebook page. You can catch up on anything that you might have missed. But today, I, I want us to think a little bit about how Baptists look at their church leaders. Baptists traditionally have understood the Bible highlighting two offices within the church, that of pastor and that of deacon. 
Now, I, I don't want this to sound like Baptists think that only pastors and deacons can serve within the church. That's not true at all, right? I mean, the Bible is incredibly clear that every single person within the body of Christ has a role to play, an important role to play. Every single one of us is necessary for the mission of the church to be fulfilled. What this belief right here says is that when you look at the New Testament structure of the church, these are the two offices, the two leadership roles that are specifically listed in the Bible and the ones that have biblical qualifications attached to them. And so we believe there's many ways to serve within the church, but when you're talking about church leadership, this is where Baptists start is with pastors and deacons. So let's take a look and see what it says, all right? Take a look in your Bible at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. This is going to be in the New Testament almost all the way to the back of your Bible, if you have a Bible with you. 1 Timothy 3. Hang on, I'm getting there. It's after Ephesians. There it is, right after Thessalonians. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3. Paul wrote this letter uh, to Timothy, who was a, a young person in ministry. And so Paul wrote this to him to give him encouragement and to give him advice and guidance um, on how to do ministry and what church life looks like. And so it's really good for us to look at this, really valuable for us. But what I want us to look at specifically today in chapter 3 is this, is this part about Paul talking about, about pastors and, and deacons. Now when, you, when we look at this section right here, in, in your Bibles, uh, the first section, there's going to be a word that Paul translates in, in my Bible as church leaders. In your Bible, it might be translated as elder or bishop or overseer. Different translations translate that word differently, but it's all referring to the same office. It's talking about a pastor in the first section. All right? So let's take a look and see what does Paul say about pastors and deacons. Here's what he says. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, or elder, or bishop, deacon, overseer, I mean, uh, not deacon, but overseer, bishop, uh, talking about a pastor, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well-respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them cl be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. When, when I was uh, graduating from college, and getting ready to go into seminary um, to study to become a pastor, I had this idea in my mind of what a pastor did. It wasn't the same as reality, but I didn't know that at the time, you know? You don't know that really till you get out there and start doing it. But in my mind, I had this idea of what a good pastor did, you know? And I thought in my mind, a good pastor, a good pastor is someone who led worship energetically and faithfully. A good pastor, a good pastor taught the Bible. A good pastor loved the people. A good pastor helped people through difficult times. These are things that I thought, okay, this is, what, this is what makes someone a good pastor. I had no idea about leading meetings or doing counseling 
or doing conflict resolution or putting out fires or, or dealing with drama in church or getting pies thrown in my face. All of these things were a surprise to me when I became a pastor. And many of these things would have been a surprise to Paul. You know, one, one of the hardest questions in the church today is what makes a pastor a good pastor? What makes a pastor a good pastor? You know why that's a hard question? It's a hard question because the role of pastor has changed so fundamentally over the last 20 years as our culture has shifted from a modern to a postmodern society. You know, the way that our world interacts with the church, it's more different today than it's ever been before, which means that the role of pastor has changed dramatically, never been like this before in the history of the church. The other reason that it's a really difficult question is because if you ask 50 different people, what makes a pastor a good pastor? Do you know how many answers you'll get? Like 75 different answers, which is why I don't ask. <laughs> but it is why I go to the Bible to find out what I should be doing. You know, you know why it's so important for pastors to go to the Bible to get their job description, to get their encouragement from scripture before they get it from anywhere else? You know why it's so important? You know why? Because if pastors don't start with the Bible, if we don't start with God's vision of us, if we don't start there, then pastors get pulled apart. There's, there's this group called the Schaefer Institute. And they do, they specialize in church research and church statistics. And what they find is that 70% of pastors battle depression constantly today. 70%. 71%, they say, are burned out. 80% of pastors say pastoral ministry has had a negative effect on their family. And they say 70% of pastors have no close friends. Other research shows that one out of 10 pastors will retire as a pastor. One out of 10. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you this to get you to feel sorry for me, right? What I'm, I'm telling you this because it's a reality that in today's world, this role gets interpreted in so many different ways. That if pastors don't start with the Bible as their guide, if they don't start there, what they do is they find themselves, they find themselves trying, just trying to make people happy. Or they find themselves trying to fulfill impossible expectations or unsure completely of what their priorities should be. And so we have to start with what the Bible says. And so this is what Peter says about pastors. Peter says this. He says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you'll get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. That, that right there helps me to stay focused on why I do what I do and why I strive so hard to come in every day and do this willingly and not grudgingly. Because I know, I understand, it is such an honor that God has called me into this position, that God has given me gifts to be able to do this and to serve in this capacity. Such an honor. Now I know also that when you look at what, what Paul says about pastors here in Timothy, man, he sets the bar high, doesn't he? Do you see, do you see what he said, what, what I'm supposed to be like? He says, he says that I'm supposed to be a man whose life is above reproach. That's how I have to live my life. I have to live my life above reproach. He says I cannot be a new believer. He says, I must not be a heavy drinker. I must not be a lover of money. I must manage my household well. I must exercise self-control. I must be able to teach. I must enjoy hosting people at my home. I can't just host people. I must enjoy hosting people at my home. And I must make sure that people outside of the church are speaking well of me. Easy stuff, right? Easy stuff. You, but you, you understand what he's talking about here? What he's really getting at here? What he's getting at is character. He's getting at character. 
You notice that none of the things he talks about in here, none of this talk about church responsibilities of a pastor. None of it. He doesn't mention anything about church responsibilities because Paul understands that if you've got someone with good, faithful character leading a church, then that church will develop into people who love and seek after Christ because the pastor is setting the example for that. Right? I mean, doesn't that make sense? This is what the pastor is supposed to be doing. Before I am good at leading meetings, before I become an expert in new church paradigms or music paradigms, before I become proficient at doing weddings and funerals, before any of that, I am to be an example of what it means to love and serve Jesus. This is what Baptists believe make a pastor a good pastor. Hopefully, I bring that here. <laughs> knowing that I'm deficient in other areas. Hopefully I bring that. So that's what Paul says about being a pastor, right? What about a deacon? What about the other role that he mentions is a deacon? Deacons are leaders within the church who are servants. Their gift is service, and they meet the needs of the members. And so the first time we ever see deacons is in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, where the disciples are feeling overwhelmed with, with all the things they have to do, so they appoint deacons to meet the needs of the people. And Baptist churches have always used deacons in some capacity to serve people within the church. Now, different churches, different Baptist churches, use deacons in different ways. Sometimes you'll find them serving different roles or meeting different needs within the church. And our church, interestingly, we don't even use that title anymore. But we do have people that are doing that. We do have people that are so committed to servant leadership in the church, even though they're doing it in an unofficial capacity. We do have deacons here, even though they're not called deacons. And so deacons, whether they are elected or appointed or people who step into that role, they're so valuable to the life of the church. Deacons often are the lifeblood of the church. So what does Paul say about them? What should we be looking for in deacons? You know, interestingly, you know what? He says almost the same thing about deacons that he says about pastors. He does. He says deacons should be faithful in their relationships. Deacons should be faithful with money. Deacons should be faithful with their faith. He says deacons ought to be people of impeccable character. This is what he's talking about when he talks about pastors and deacons, these two offices within the church. Now again, we as Baptists, we do not believe that pastors and deacons are the only opportunities to serve. All we're saying is that when you look in scripture, these are the two offices listed. This is where leadership starts in the church. But when you look at this, what it's emphasizing above anything else is a person's character. It, is, it does not talk about personality traits. It does not talk about their occupation. It does not talk about skills. What God is looking for in church leaders is faithful character. But truthfully, isn't that what God wants to see in all of us? I mean, doesn't want, God want to see that in all of us? He wants to see us as people who will reflect his son to the world, right? That's what he wants to see. He wants to see people who are transformed, whose hearts and minds and lives are transformed by his son Jesus and people who are willing to go out there and set that example for the world so that others can experience the same thing we've experienced, right? He wants us to be people who are willing to walk in his light every day. People who are not going to walk by our own agendas and our own standards, but we walk in his light. He wants all of us. He wants pastors. He wants deacons. He wants all members of this church to ask this question. What makes a leader a good leader? What makes a leader a good leader? He wants us to ask that question. And he wants us to grow into that answer. Because like it or not, you're a leader. You're a leader. You who have been touched by Jesus. You who have been redeemed by him. You who have been called and claimed by him. You're a leader in this broken world. You are. And it's not about being good at something in particular. It's not about your profession. It's not about being outgoing or boisterous or spontaneous or charismatic. It's not about that. Being a leader is about faithful character. God wants you and he wants me to take on the character of his son Jesus and show the world what it looks like. That's what he wants us to do.
That's what makes a church leader a good church leader. And that's what we've got to do. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Lead us to be good leaders, oh God. Develop within us the qualities and the character that are needed to represent you in this world. Help each of us to examine ourselves. No matter what role we play in the church, help us examine ourselves so that we can show this world what the heart and what the life of Jesus look like. We pray this and we pray for your help in this. In Jesus' name. Amen.